Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this video. I am going to be doing a review of a Muslim apologist, a Muslim missionary, a da'i, who is giving some terrible reasons as to why he thinks Christianity is wrong and the Bible isn't preserved. And as always, he introduces as many terrible and weak points as he possibly can in his short video. Uh, and I'll be dismantling them all and also demonstrating why he is projecting and how actually Islam is the religion with the issues he's mentioning. Let's go. According to the 2021 consensus in England and Wales by the Office of National Statistics, for the first time in a census of England and Wales, less than half of the population, 46.2%, 27.5 million people, describe themselves as Christians. A 13.1 percentage point decrease from 59.3%, 33.3 million in 2011. Despite this decrease, Christian remained the most common response to the religion question. But at the same time, you can see an increase in other religions, for example, Islam. There were increases in the number of people who described themselves as Muslim. 3.9 million, 6.5% in 2021, up from 2.7 million, 4.9% in 2011. And Hindu, 1 million, 1.7% 1 in 2021, up from 818,000, 1.5% 1 in 2011. Now the census data I think is somewhat misleading because Muslims like to sort of picture this grand victorious thing where it's like, yes, we're finally winning, guys. We're getting some traction. We've gone from like 1% to like 3 or 4%. Oh, it's amazing. Well, not so, not so quick. According to a report from the Muslim Council of Britain, published in 2015, we can see that 53% of the Muslims who are in the UK are not actually from the UK. They would be counted twice any census data that is done in their home countries and the census data that is done in the UK, depending on exactly when they moved from that country to the UK. If more than half of the group that you supposedly think are going to bring it home for the Muslims are not actually from the country that you're counting them from, it's a bit disingenuous. It would be a bit like counting all the British people in colonized India and saying that this is because all the Indian people have seen the benefits of the British way and have joined the empire. Not quite. It's mostly due to the fact that we went there and we colonized it. I mean, that's obvious. <laughs> It's of course also worth noting that since roughly 1997, the level of immigration this nation has had has been increasing rapidly into the hundreds of thousands per year. A significant amount of those hundreds of thousands per year are people from Muslim nations who hold themselves as Muslims. Now let's look at the actual decrease in Christianity. The decrease in Christianity from the last two census reports demonstrates what? Well, where did those people go? Where did those people who stopped being Christian, what religion did they pick up as instead? What did they convert to? Well, they converted to nothing. They converted to atheism. And it's pretty much almost one for one. In other words, every person that left Christianity, about 95, if not above percent, went to either agnosticism, atheism, a spiritual belief, or nothing. As in, they didn't even put an answer when they were asked. So how do we explain the absolutely tiny increase in percentage-wise of the population being Muslim? Well, like I said, it's immigration. People have known this for long periods of time. And the Dao groups have been saying again and again, the avalanche of apostasy is upon us. Our youth are leaving Islam in, in crazy numbers. 25% of, of the Muslim youth are leaving Islam. Well, yeah, because it's a terrible religion. I want to tell you something that I've studied. Mm. I've studied. Mm -hmm. yes. It's the religion with the large number of defectors, the largest number of defectors. Mm. Did you know that? Mm. I can tell you. That doesn't mean the number of defectors is more than the number of those yeah. who enter, but from all others, those who are leaving Islam. And you don't even know, people are living in your home and it's second, third generation in, in the Western world. They're not even Muslim. Absolutely. They're not even Muslim. They don't care about Islam, but their name is Muslim and you think they're Muslim because they're in the situation. I did a little survey of Salatul Eid and I found that 50% of the guys don't even go to Eid. Allah. Mm. They don't even go to Eid. Subhanallah. And we have access to the internet now. Check out this really cool map. You can check the latest census data for England and Wales and you can search for it by 
religion. Here we can see all the places in which there is no religion. People who have answered they are atheist or in some sense agnostic or spiritual but not religious. As you can see there is quite significant numbers across the UK. We're ranging at 40%. I mean generally you could say the average is 40%. Here is quite high 56%, 48%, 40%. You get the idea. Now let's do the same for Christian. Oh look it's very similar. We see areas of high concentrated Christianity. 50% over here, 60% and areas where there are low, like over here at 36%. But generally speaking, there is good coverage of Christians in the UK, just as there is good coverage of people who are atheists or agnostic in the UK. Now let's look at Muslim. Oh, the vast majority has next to no Muslims at all. In fact, the overwhelming majority of the UK, probably about 90-ish percent of it, has less than 1% of its population being Muslim. Great job, guys. Instead, all of the areas with a significant Muslim population are focused in Cities, large cities. In fact, you can basically narrow it down to Manchester, Birmingham, and London. Islam isn't spreading at all. It's just isolated into areas of significant wealth that are good for economic reasons, which is exactly why it attracts immigrants. Immigrants don't come to the UK to live in the middle of nowhere in a tiny little village. Instead, they go to the cities. And that's why there are now areas of London that are predominantly Muslim. Not because they were all convinced of the Dawah and that London had a sudden change of heart, but rather because a lot of people went there. That is it. His point is very, very dumb. And one of the reasons why Christianity is declining is the Bible. People start believing that the Bible is from God because they could finally read it freely. You might not know this simple fact, but Christians were denied access to the Bible. Only the church was allowed to read it. According to heresy and authority in medieval Europe by Edward Murray Peters, pages 194 and 195. It caused the canons of the Council of Toulouse in France 1229. Let's read Canon 14. We prohibit also that the laity should be permitted to have the books of the Old or New Testament unless anyone from motives of devotion should wish to have the Psalter of the Bravery for divine offices or the hours of the Blessed Virgin. But we most strictly forbid their having any translation of these books. The Bible was not a public book and people accepted Christianity blindly without even investigating what it says in the Bible. So the first point is um Really, 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 really dumb. Like, really, really silly. Basically, something to do with the fact that Christianity in the, in the UK, which is where I'm from and where I've been living my whole life, has been decreasing. Islam is increasing. Therefore, Islam good and true? Is that, is that the point? He then talks about how this is because Christians are reading the Bible because they couldn't before because it wasn't available to them because it was hidden and the church wouldn't translate the Bible for them. You know, I remember back in my day when I was struggling to get Bibles. You know, I just really wanted a Bible. I wanted to open the word, but oh, the church wouldn't translate it into English for me. <laughs> of course, that's absolutely nonsense. The Bible has been available in the common language for hundreds of years. I mean, at the very least, 500 years. So it obviously has nothing to do with the Bible being translated for the first time. Christians have known their scripture for long, long periods of time. And again, you'd also have to demonstrate that they were being lied to about their doctrinal beliefs, which you can't demonstrate at all because they weren't. And we have historical documents to prove that the basic foundation of Christianity has been the same since the foundation of the church at the time of Christ. The Islamic perspective, and I think this is projection, is that the Quran isn't really a Quran if it's not in Arabic. In fact, historically, there have always been issues with translating the Quran into other languages, largely because it openly admits the fact that there is complete nonsense in the Quran. And I don't mean that as some sort of petty insult. I mean that as an actual literal thing. There is nonsense in the Quran. In 29 of the different surahs of the Quran, they begin with opening verses of mysterious letters, as the scholars know them as, that are just Arabic letters that don't form any known words. Alif, Lam, Ra. Alif, Lam, Mim. Yasin. Taha. Like, all these things. And you, they can't be translated because of this, because the actual scholars themselves and the oral tradition that Islam supposedly thrives from don't have a clue what they mean. And if they don't know what they mean, they can't be translated. And as soon as you try and translate it, you end up with awkward things like this. Alif, Lam, Ra. These are the verses of the wise book. Alif, Lam, Ra. This is a book whose verses are perfected and then presented in detail from one who is wise and aware. Alif, Lam, Ra. These are the verses of the clear book. You know, it doesn't seem so clear if I, if you can't translate it. I mean, it kind of seems like it's unclear. Huh. But alright, that's not a contradiction.
Alif Lam Ra. <laughs> this is a book which we have revealed to you, O Muhammad. That is by bringing... No, 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 no. You get the point. Another verse where it has nonsense in it. My personal favorite, though, is Surah 20, the Surah of Taha. The very first verse, Taha. Don't know if I'm getting the correct Arabic right for that nonsense word, but um, hopefully I am. And we could even look... <laughs> at the Arabic uh, transliteration, and it just says, Taha. Well done, guys. Your Quran is a complete mess. Now, normally, as a Christian, I wouldn't be bothered by this. I don't hold to the doctrine of perfect preservation. Christians don't believe the book came down from the sky and has been untouched since. That would be silly. Instead, what Christians believe is that man wrote down the scriptures. They are products of man that are inspired through the Holy Spirit, inspired through God. The Muslim perspective is perfect preservation. They do actually believe it came down from the sky, in effect. It was sent down, it was already done, it's all good. It's, it's pre-existed for, at the very least, a long, long time, if not eternally, as the words of Allah. So for the Islamic perspective, having random letters and words that don't mean anything is a problem because your doctrine of perfect preservation is in serious trouble now. This isn't to mention that the Quran has at least 10 different authorized versions of itself. And I don't mean version like a translation, like the King James or the New International Version or ESV, for example. No, no, no. What I actually mean is the Quran has 10 different versions of itself called the Qala'a or the readings, which are authorized by scholars to be used in mosques. They have variants. Lots and lots and lots of lovely variants. In fact, there is a very helpful book, which is published by uh, Dr. Fadel Soliman from the Bridges Foundation, which is a Dawa team in Cairo, Egypt. They published a book. It is called the Bridges Translation of the Ten Kil'at of the Holy Quran. And in that book, they very happily translate the different Kil'at variant readings in the footnotes for each verse of the Quran. Now, supposedly, all these different variants, 10 of them, by the way, go back to Muhammad. Muhammad said all of these, so it's all okay. Well, that means that Muhammad was a very strange kind of person who would say scripture 10 different ways whenever he would recite the Quran. I don't buy that. I think that's obviously silly. One of my favorite variants is in the legendary verse of Surah 43, Ayah 81, where we read, Say, O Muhammad, if the most merciful had a son, then I would be the first of his worshippers. I love this hypothetical that the Quran has because Muhammad, Jesus is Lord and he is the son of God. So you should worship him according to the Quran. What's interesting is that there's a variant when we get to the word son. In Arabic, there are different kula'at that translate this differently. Some translate it as children or plural of sons. In other words, if the most merciful had sons, then I would be the first of his worshippers. There is quite a big difference between saying if he had one and if he had many. And there are many instances you'll notice in the Qur'an variants where one and many become confused, which in turn actually affects doctrine. Again, I don't see this as a massive issue because I hold to the Christian position. I don't believe that the text is perfectly preserved. I think the message is perfectly preserved. Everything that God wanted to reveal is revealed and it is with us today. Islam, on the other hand, is in a really bad position, and I don't think Muslims are going to hold this for too much longer, because it's getting ridiculous now. There's the famous Qur'at variant of Surah Al-Fatiha, Surah Al-Fatiha verse 4, I think it is. Let's check it out. Yeah, you have Maliki al madin or Maliki al madin whether he is the owner or whether he is the king of the Day of Recompense. So clearly there are variants, and the only way that Muslims even reconcile the different readings is through the hadith that talks about Muhammad authorizing different readings. Oh, how interesting. Muhammad is saying it's okay to have different Qurans. All right, then. Well, that solves the problem. Muhammad said you can have different Qurans. It's all okay. We can go home. There's no problem. There's, there's just 10 Qurans. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Oh, wait. Muhammad says there were seven. Yeah, he said there were seven. He didn't say there was 10. So how did you end up with 10? I'll give you a clue. You added them. Your scholars quite literally found more readings and saw how well used they were by their communities and went, okay, let's increase the number from seven to 10. This is why scholars like Dr. Yasakali don't hold to the view that the Aruf or the seven supposed readings that Muhammad recited in and the Qur'at readings are the same thing because they're not the same numerically. This means that Muhammad revealed something in seven different ways, but we don't have those seven different ways today. We have 10. And even then, those 10 are only 10 that we accepted. There was 50, if not more, different uh, unauthorized Qur'at readings that simply weren't selected by big brain people. So what happened to these seven different readings? Because according to the Islamic, standard Islamic narrative, which is totally reliable and trustworthy, Uthman got these Quranic materials, according to Sahih Hadith, 
and he burned them, those that he did not accept, and he canonized it into a single reading, that of the Qureshi dialect. But wait, there are seven different Aruf, but only one copy. Where did the other six Aruf go? Did he pick one and then get rid of the others and burn them? as part of the Quranic materials he burned? If he had all seven, then where are they today? We don't have them. In other words, according to the Islamic tradition, probably six out of seven different readings of Muhammad have been lost. Whoops. There goes perfect preservation. Ah, but the oral tradition has preserved it. We've got it in oral tradition. No, you don't. Oral tradition can't preserve even how many verses there are in the Quran. That's up for debate. Is the Bismillah a verse in the Quran? Depends who you ask. What do the mysterious letters mean? Hmm, it's just garbage. The oral tradition could not preserve a lot of detail about the Quran. There are quite literally surahs with names that you don't even know what they mean. Again, not a problem for us Christians. We don't think that's too much of an issue. I mean, it would be very weird, but hey, it doesn't affect our salvation. We still have the perfect preserved meaning. Christ is Lord and he came for us to atone for our sins so that we may have eternal life in him. Kind of a problem for you though, given that you think that the Quran is perfectly preserved. Yeah, it's not though. It's really not. The contradictions thing is funny, largely because the Quran itself has no issue with contradictions. We read in Surah An-Nisa, Ayah 82. Then do they not reflect upon the Quran? That's a little bit hard if a lot of it is unreadable. But anyway, if they had been from any other than Allah, they would have found within it much contradiction. Now Muslims, they spin this brilliantly. They go, ah, see? The Quran is from God because there's no contradiction in it. Ignore the fact that this is logically dumb because there are many things that don't have contradictions in it. I can write a very long page of random facts and there'll be no contradiction and it doesn't mean it's from God, it's obviously from me. But anyway, the Quran actually says, if you look closely at the Arabic, much contradiction, not any, much. In other words, the Quran isn't concerned about there being contradictions, it's concerned if there's quite a few contradictions. So um, yeah, that's, that's weird. But hey, the Quran I don't think as such is that contradictory, I have to say it. I, I really do. The Quran, I don't think is that contradictory. I think it's just plain wrong. <laughs> I think it's just full of error and falsehood. There are tons of examples in the Quran of just obvious falsehood that cannot be reconciled with reality. Take into account the entire doctrine that is spread throughout the Quran that says very clearly that we are to affirm the validity of the previous scriptures. Muhammad had wives and companions who were in Trinitarian Ethiopia. Muhammad calls the Trinitarians in Najran believers, mu'min, and he says they were following the will of Allah. Muhammad had a sex slave called Mary the Copt from where? The clues in the name. She was from Egypt. What did they believe in Egypt? I don't know, the Coptic Orthodox Church? Huh, I wonder if they were, oh, they were Nicene breed believing Christians who were Trinitarians. Oh no. So even, the people Muhammad was sleeping with at one point in their lives were Trinitarians, and yet Muhammad thinks it's okay to be like, yeah, those Christians have nothing to stand on if they don't judge by the gospel. Oof, Muhammad, that's, that was not, not a good thing to say. You should have clearly distinguished between whatever weird sect of Christianity he somewhat thinks is around him as well, which, given that the Islamic history clearly says he was chilling with Trinitarians quite a bit, he would think he would know what their scripture says. You would think he would know that there was cross imagery on Ethiopian churches. There are Ethiopian churches at the time of Muhammad, near where supposedly he, his companions docked at when they went to the kingdom of Aksum, that are Byzantine churches <laughs> that the Byzantine Empire helped to fund. How does this make any sense that Muhammad didn't understand what Trinitarian was and why did he keep telling them to follow the gospel? The answer is simple. Muhammad didn't know what was written in the gospels. He thought it conformed to what he was saying. He thought whenever he heard differing, different views, whenever he heard talk of the Trinity, he thought that was just people making it up. He didn't realize that comes from our scripture. So when he affirmed our scripture, he made a big boo-boo. This is one of the many ways the Quran is in blatant error. And Muslims have to do absolute loops, loop de loop de loop gymnastics to try and get out of this. But the simple fact is the Quran affirms the Injil. You want to know how to prove this real simple? Ask a Muslim to show you a single manuscript of the real Injil that came from Allah. Where is it? Because Muhammad says it was around in his time. Muhammad even says that one of the proofs of the Quran, by the way, this is another dumb error. One of the proofs of the Quran is that Muhammad actually says, you can find me in the Injil. You can find me in the Torah that you have with you. Which is Surah 7, Ayah 157. Surah 61, Ayah 6. So where is that then? If Muhammad had the original Injil and Torah in his time, in his day, in the Hijaz, why was it not preserved by Muslims who could have used it as proof to convince the entire world of Christians and Jews that they need to repent and turn to Islam?
it doesn't exist. In fact, Muslims actually tried to forge these. They tried to make these up centuries later because they realized how embarrassing it was that in the Quran, there is a proof of its validity. The proofhood of Muhammad's prophethood is that the Injil and the Torah mention him, but they can't show that. Christians kept saying, where is it? Where is it? Oh, you know, your Bible's been corrupted. But it was with Muhammad, so what the hell happened to it? Christians didn't invade the Hijaz. What, what happened? Oh, it, it just... It just went somewhere. Yeah, Islam is done. One last point. He brought up the whole uh, textual criticism. Textual criticism um, exploded, apparently, when people could read the Bible, which, according to him, was like 20 years ago. No. Textual criticism exploded due to partly the Enlightenment. People started to have ideas that you could critically evaluate things to get closer to the truth. And that religious dogma or idealism should be challenged. Not just to destroy it, but to harden it, to make it better, more closer to what we think is. Because again, the empirical method is valuable and should be used. Islam, <laughs> on the other hand, you know, they weren't too big on this. Uh, really? Yeah, really. You know that Fidel Soliman book I told you you could go get? You used to be able to get it directly on Quran.com as part of their translations in English. I love that, but they've got rid of it now. Probably because they know people like me are using it. Islam doesn't like criticism. It can't really sustain it. Christianity embraced it and said, bring it on, let's see what happens. Islam was like, whoa, <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we don't like this. We really don't like this. Which is why the avalanche of apostasy is ongoing and will be ongoing and getting worse every day until Islam is now completely evaporated. You cannot keep believing in a religion that has evidently made up stuff to protect its own doctrines. The Quran is not perfectly preserved, it never has been. Even the early Muslims didn't believe it was. But yeah, Muslims today will tell you that yes, perfectly preserved, no issues whatsoever. They'll brag about it being free of contradictions, but it contains really dumb things. <laughs> like nonsense statements, historical claims that are evidently false by all evidence. And so for that reason, ladies and gentlemen, there's a better way in Jesus Christ. We have our Lord and our Savior who died for us so that we could have eternal life. We don't believe in silly doctrines like books that come down from the sky because they've been preserved eternally in tablet form. And I don't mean like an Android tablet, I mean like an actual tablet. Presumably a very big tablet, I don't know, maybe there's multiple of them. Islam hates the disbelievers, Islam hates me. God, on the other hand, the true God, loves you and wants you, and even loves this guy, right? Gotta give him a break at some point. He is loved and God calls him to the true religion and not to a religion that came 600 years later and made very strange and peculiar things based off what one guy had seen in the cave when he thought he was being attacked by something demonic. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you have a great day. God bless you all. Take care.